from the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador. I'm Carla Gonzalez and this is From the South. With 100% of votes counted in Uruguay's runoff of presidential election, the result is a technical draw. The right-wing National Party candidate Luis Lacalle Po has announced victory and reportedly leads the broad front candidate Daniel Martinez by 28, uh, votes, 28,000 votes. The Electoral Court will conduct a recount and the country's next president is expected to be announced later in the week. The Progressive Broad Front Coalition have governed Uruguay for 14 years. However, La Calle Po managed to unite five conservative opposition parties for the runoff vote. Obviously, in the absence of acceptance of the government candidate conceding the vote, the president and us will find out what will happen in a few days when the court formally says that the multicolored coalition won this election on November 24. What's clear in this election, which some expected to end up differently, is that the party that wins, the president-elect, will in no case reach 50%. They tried to bury us. What they didn't know is that we are the seed. Bolivia's de facto government has enacted the exceptional and transitional regime law for the holding of general elections. On Sunday, the Bolivian Congress approved the law, which was signed by Senator and self-proclaimed President Jenny Añez. The law recognizes the participation of all political organizations, except for those who have been re-elected in two previous terms. This ultimately disallows President Evo Morales and his Vice President, Álvaro García Linera, from participating. The Supreme Electoral Tribunal now has a maximum 20-day term to elect new members in order to set a date for general elections in Bolivia by 2020. Meanwhile, Añez denied a law that will protect the members of the movement towards socialism from political persecution. And the people who were massacred by police in Sencata, El Alto, have been laid to rest. Last Friday, protesters blocked access to the fuel depot in Sencata. Armed forces in helicopters killed at least nine people and injured more than 30. Relatives of the deceased have spoken to the representatives of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, denouncing the use of violence by the armed forces, controlled by the de facto government. Just then, the military showed up and they started shooting. I saw a young man who was shot in the back of the neck. I wanted to catch him, but he was shot in the head. By the moment I tried to catch him, they started to shoot at me, and I ran away. But while I was running, I was shot in the heel. I asked for justice for all the wounded, for all the dead. It is not right that they do this to us. Thousands of Colombians continue to protest against the neoliberal reforms proposed by the government of President Ivan Duque in spite of harsh measures against them. Protesters mobilized despite the curfew in Bogota, the militarization of the streets and the repression of peaceful demonstrators. Caving to the pressure, Duque has proposed a national dialogue to pacify the education, indigenous and health sectors that led the protests. He will meet with the newly elected governors and mayors who will begin their tenure on January 1st to include them in the talks. Since last Thursday, thousands of citizens took to the streets to reject the repressive tactics of the police special forces. Chile's President Sebastián Piñera has announced that he will bring a new bill to Congress that will grant impunity to security forces who are accused of killing and violently repressing demonstrators. He also says that there will be an additional 4,300 policemen on the streets in the next 60 days. This week, we are sending a bill to the Congress that will allow our armed forces, without the need for a state of emergency or restricting citizens' rights, to protect the critical infrastructure of our country. 
such as the water, electrical supply mechanisms, and much more. This is to guarantee that vital services function. In Brazil, Congresswoman Glacy Hoffman has been re-elected as the leader of the Workers' Party. Among her goals for her new mandate are leading the opposition against the country's far-right president and creating an economic alternative to neoliberalism. A correspondent in Sao Paulo, Brian Mir, has details. In Sao Paulo, Brazil, the 7th National Brazilian Workers' Party, or PT Congress, has just come to an end, and the delegates present re-elected Paraná Congresswoman Glazy Hoffman as the party president. She'll serve for another four years now. And it's meaningful that she was re-elected because she represents some of the farther left internal caucuses within the party, such as Democratic Socialists and the Socialist Movement of PT, Avante. She attended Nicolas Maduro's inauguration in January. She's a strong supporter of the, the Venezuelan people of Bolivian socialism and other left movements in the global south. Now during the Congress, the delegates present also deliberated on what the priorities should be for the party for the next four years. Now some of these priorities include creating an alternative economic development plan to neoliberalism, halting the advance of neo-fascism, creating electoral plans to win the highest number of seats in the 2020 mayoral and city council elections, and getting all charges against former President Luis Inácio Lula da Silva reversed. That was a correspondent, Brian Mir. In other news, Mexico's National Commission for Human Rights will be led for the first time by a woman. Rosario Piedra Ibarra has compromised to transform this institution as she is the sister of someone who has forcibly disappeared. The disappearance of people is a phenomenon that sees no end in Mexico. Since over a year ago, Lucas Avendaño, an anthropologist and artist, has been on a mission to find his brother, a difficult task in a country where there are 40,000 cases of disappeared people since 2006. The Interior Ministry has changed the person in charge of these cases five times already. Whoever takes over needs between two and four months to catch up with the files, so every time it happens, we are set back. To find Bruno, he's appealed to numerous governmental institutions in the state of Oaxaca. He hopes the case will move forward in the National Commission for Human Rights with the arrival of Rosario Piedra Ibarra as the new head of the commission. I have the support of all collectives of victims of civil association of people who have been fighting for their rights for many years, not just of people who have been forcibly disappeared, but also environmentalists, of migrant defenders, and of journalists. During her first meeting with the press, Piedra Ibarra said that she will work with all sectors of society, even those who oppose her as she will need all the help she can get to advance with the numerous investigations. In cases where the Commission made recommendations, they were left as such. We need to find legal mechanisms so that our recommendations are executed, and if they are not, to find ways to extract pressure. President Andrés Manuel López Obrador has supported Piedra Ibarra's appointment and has compromised to lower cases of human rights violations during his term in office, especially by the armed forces. They are doing a great effort so that this very important institution can guarantee public security without any violation of human rights. Over Mexico's last two administrations, the Army and the Navy were among the organizations with the most complaints against them for violating human rights. Just between 2006 and 2012, under President Felipe Calderón, there were more than 9,000 complaints against them. After the break, autonomy for a 10th Ethiopian region. Don't go away. Innovation. Science, the technological breakthrough and its influence in society. Viajeros del saber, el futuro está aquí. Atman. Monday, only on Telesur.
Welcome back. In Dominica, Prime Minister Roosevelt Skerritt has denounced interference sponsored by the OAS to delegitimize upcoming general elections. Skerritt denounced attempts by the OAS to interfere in the internal affairs of the island, rejecting attempts to generate violent acts within the country intended to harm the December 6 general elections. This comes after the OAS Secretary General Luis Almagro said that free and fair elections would not be held in Dominica. Those elections, those elections will be free and fair despite your lies, despite your nastiness, despite your attempts to sow seeds of destruction, and despite your attempt to have outside meddling. And we say, hands off, Dominica. Thousands of Venezuelan students flooded the streets to mark a University Students' Day on Thursday, as well as to highlight the achievements of the Bolivarian government. Students in support of the opposition mobilized. However, their gathering was small and not the magnitude their leaders had hoped for. They managed to fill a one-way street pledging to execute a coup d'etat like the one that was successfully carried out in Bolivia. Today, expectations were fulfilled. The square is not full of people, but full of will. On the other side, there is a mass demonstration by revolutionaries. We are you that wants progress, the you that wants love, the you that wants Venezuela to move forward. November 21st is marked to celebrate University Students Day, but supporters of the government and the opposition disagree on how. For young opposition members, their goal is to oust President Nicolás Maduro. Their political leaders were absent, said to be in the United States for the past nine months. The Chavista march was filled with color and the warmth of the people. The revolutionary youth want to defend Venezuela's peace and sovereignty. Today we march for our homeland and in support of peace, not just for Venezuela, but for the countries of Latin America and the world. Today we are saying that there is hope for Venezuela. Both sides approached Tuna Fort, the main military complex in the country, and subsequently engaged in dialogue. This took place between opposition protesters and revolutionary students from different public and military universities. Today, we demonstrate that we support the Constitution and that the military understand that they must make a way for democracy. I feel very proud because we, as armed forces, are people too. And you, the people, can approach and talk to us. That's something you cannot do in every country. In Bolivia, for example, no civilian can approach the military because they will suppress and kill you. And the next day, you disappear. Another special moment was the union between military students and revolutionary youth, an act that speaks for itself. Students from other countries who participated in the event said it wasn't what they expected. It's the first time I visited Venezuela and it's very surprising. The media shows us that here is totally destroyed, that the revolution has failed and that the opposition has the power. But that's a lie. We've realized that the revolution is stronger than ever. And so they sang and chanted their way to the military academy. I extend my hands to the students who support the opposition. Today they participated in a demonstration that was guarded by the Bolivarian National Police Service and it was all in peace, as it should always be. And I want to send them a message. They left today chanting with autonomy to overthrow the tyranny. And I said, oh, they want to overthrow me. It's okay. But until the day that you overthrow me, let me help you. 
The day ended as the military and university students swore to remain loyal to the country and to peace. The South African Navy is playing host to China and Russia for a joint maritime exercise just off the Cape Town coast. The first to arrive in the Cape Town harbor was the Russian cruiser Marshal Ustinov. A small crowd welcomed the Chinese People's Liberation Army frigate Wei Fang. The exercise is the first of its kind between the three countries and is scheduled for this coming week. The operation is primarily focused on economic security, interoperability and maintaining good relations between the participating navies. The theme is promotion of safe navigation and maritime economic security. One of the key objectives is the training of a multinational task organization to counter security threats at sea. Vote counting is underway in Guinea-Bissau after presidential elections. Security forces have been deployed to ensure the process is carried out safely. The election is expected to bring stability to the West African country after years of political turmoil. Guinea-Bissau has suffered nine coups or attempted coups since gaining independence from Portugal in 1974. Namibia is also set to hold presidential and parliamentary elections next week. Hagi Gengob is seeking a second and final term in office under his South West Africa People's Organization Party. Gengob is challenged by eight other candidates, including Esther Mwinjangje of the National Unity Democratic Organization. She's the first woman to run for the position in the nation's history. This is the country's sixth election since independence in 1990. <laughs> The Sidama ethnic group, which represents 4% of Ethiopia's 105 million population, has voted overwhelmingly to form their own self-governing region. According to the country's electoral board, provisional results show that 98.5% of voters backed the change in Wednesday's ballot, with the turnout reaching 99.7%. This will make Hawassa City Ethiopia's 10th self-governing region. Residents will now control taxes, education, security and certain legislation. The election has ended peacefully and that is a good thing. Every ethnicity that lives in the Sidama zone and Hawassa City should coexist peacefully and with respect for each other. The Navy has declared the results of the referendum across polling stations in Sidama Zone. The election outcome indications show the long-standing Sidama struggle has been successfully achieved. Still to come, protesters in Lebanon mark Independence Day with anti-corruption protests. Stay with us. Somos esa ventana que se abre para visibilizarlos entre fronteras. Third Thursday, only on LS1. joining us again. Citizens in the Pacific island of Bougainville have voted in a referendum towards independence from Papua New Guinea. More than 207,000 citizens are registered to vote in the election that will determine if the nation will have full independence or greater autonomy. Results are expected to be released on December 15th. 
The Bougainville quest for independence has been ongoing since 1997. A peace agreement was completed in 2001, which led to the referendum, ending a decade-long war between Bougainville rebels, PNG security forces, and foreign mercenaries, which killed 20,000 people. I feel proud because I'm part of the generation that even though um, we were born after the crisis, um, we had um, relatives who were lost during the crisis. Today was a good day for world peace. It's not often that uh, we hear reports that uh, people have put down their weapons and sought ways to uh, mend fences and carry forward um, establishing peace. A measles outbreak in Samoa, mostly among children under the age of five, has claimed 22 lives, eight days after the Pacific Island declared a state of emergency over the epidemic. The Pacific Island declared the outbreak in late October after the first deaths were recorded. Almost 2,000 suspected cases have been identified over the past week. Many are turning to different means to combat the disease. They feel in panic because of it's getting worse, because the last time they, this, this mystery was here in Samoa, it's, it's not worse like this. I have faith in God, and, and, and God is protecting my children, like I have results, but it's because anybody else had to do it, and we have to follow. Lebanon has commemorated Independence Day amid anti-government protests. Citizens celebrated 76 years of self-rule with protesters joining festivities nationwide. Muslims and Christians from across the political spectrum joined hands to march against corruption by government officials. Security forces in Iraq fired live ammunition at protesters in the southern port city of Umm Qasar, killing at least five. More than 50 others were injured. On Saturday, at least three protesters were also killed and over 40 others injured in Nasirilla. Since the protests began in October, more than 300 people have died due to violent state repression. Protesters have been demanding an end to corruption, a solution to rising unemployment and better public services. We came peacefully. Then the security forces arrived and clashes erupted with demonstrators. They fired live ammunition. They shot at us. The bodies of five migrant women who drowned after their boat capsized in the south of Italy have been retrieved. Rescue workers are still searching for more victims. Hundreds of migrants have died in recent years trying to cross the Mediterranean Sea from northern Africa into Italy. And thousands of people have marched in Paris to condemn violence against women. The demonstration began near the main opera house with protesters holding posters with the names of relatives or friends killed in gender violence. The group is also denouncing growing femicides which have claimed at least 116 lives so far this year in France. They isolate themselves and when they begin to do that, they feel diminished. They lose their self-confidence. They feel that everything has been done so they feel inferior and to prevent them from defending themselves. And in addition, because many women don't earn so much, they cannot leave the abusive relationship. In Belgium, thousands of people also marched in the capital, Brussels. At least 100 women have been killed in this country in the last three years. In solidarity with women across the world. You might have heard the women and men shouting it. The message is stop to violence against women, all kind of violence. In Romania, Klaus Iohannis has won a second term in office following runoff elections. Exit polls on Sunday showed Iohannis scooping 65.5% of the vote, with former Prime Minister Viorica Dancila of the Social Democratic Party taking 33.5%. In the first round, two weeks ago, Johannes won by 37.8 percent, to Dancila's 22.2 percent. There are many things still to be done, to be repaired. I will involve myself to create a new majority comprised by the democratic parties that will lead Romania towards modernization, towards a normal Romania. And I promise you that I'll be a president totally fighting for Romania. And finally, the Latin American Conference Adelante has taken place in the United Kingdom. 
The meeting aims to set new agendas and discuss common challenges faced by leaders across the region. Our correspondent in London, Pablo Navarrete, has more. Here in the centre of London, hundreds have gathered for the annual Latin America conference, the biggest uh, conference in solidarity with Latin America in Europe. We've heard uh, numerous speakers uh, talk about uh, the need for solidarity with the region in the face of coups in places like Bolivia. Uh, there have been workshops on the uh, misrepresentation of uh, the reality of Latin America today in the British media and in other English-speaking media. Earlier on, a message from Lula uh, was read out to the conference where he uh, gave his salutations to those here and also expressed, uh, gave an update about what was taking place in Brazil and elsewhere in Latin America. There was also a video conference with Noam Chomsky who um, offered his assessment of developments in countries like Chile. So there have been uh, many workshops dealing with um, issues of labor rights in, uh, in uh, Colombia, the, the, the issue of uh, the peace process, uh, the coup in Bolivia, and the need for solidarity with countries uh, such as Venezuela, and hundreds of academics, journalists, and social movement uh, uh, members have gathered here to express solidarity with Latin America. That was Paolo Navarrete, and with that we end our news brief. But you can find all of our stories by checking our website, telesurenglish.net. And be also sure to join us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Carla Gonzalez. Thank you for watching.